Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the College of Engineering virtual brown bag series. Uh, we have this series all semester on Wednesdays and Fridays, and uh, looking forward to one great talk today. Uh, incidentally, today's brown bag is the last one for the semester, and we will be restarting it again in the fall. Uh, but we should have the schedule out, uh, you know, sometime over the summer. So keep checking back, and we'll have more information for you. Uh, my name is Gautam Das, and I'm uh, the Associate Dean for Research College of Engineering, and today I'll be hosting uh, the presentation. Uh, it's always the last but not the least, uh, one of our more exciting presentations, I hope. Uh, the topic is uh, prediction-led police deployment and patrol operations, and uh, our presenter is our uh, Assistant Professor from Industrial Engineering, Yuan Zhou, and um, you know, she'll be talking for about 40, 45 minutes, and we should have enough time at the end for question answers. Uh, by the way, for question answers, uh, there is a little uh, dialogue box on Teams. Uh, so whenever you have any questions, uh, please feel to type it up there. And once the talk is over, so we will not interrupt her while she's giving the presentation, but when the talk is over, I'll be happy to read out your questions and we'll uh, you know, ask her to uh, give her insights into the answers. So uh, what is this talk about? Uh, you know, police patrolling plays a key role in responding to 911 calls, reducing crimes and all that. Everybody knows that. But the traditional deployment strategies have been reactive in the sense that officers often respond to crime rather than prevent crime. And you know, there is a stationariness to their, uh, to their patrolling, so the same weekly schedule and so on. But in recent years, due to a lot of uh, policing data, uh, there has been interest in predictive policing. So using algorithms to an analyze a lot of data to predict and prevent future crimes. And I will not get into the details of some of these. Uh, we will let uh, Professor Zhao talk about them. She's doing some exciting work in this space. A little bit of her bio. Uh, Yuan Zhao is an assistant professor, as I mentioned, in the industry and manufacturing systems engineering here at UTA. She received her bachelor's degree in mechanical and electrical engineering from Beijing Institute of Technology, Beijing, China, and a PhD degree in industrial and systems engineering from sunny Buffalo, New York. Uh, Dr. Zhao's research specializes in complex systems modeling, agent-based and discrete event simulation, performance measurement and process improvement. Her research has been applied to solving real world problems in law enforcement, healthcare, traffic, public services, so a wide range of application areas. She is a member of the Institute for Operations Research and Management Sciences, INFORMS, the Institute of Industrial and Systems Engineering, IISC, and the Society for Health Systems, SHS. So, with this, uh, I would like to welcome Dr. Zara to start her presentation. Thank you, Dr. Das, for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining the meeting for my talk today. Um, so I'm very uh, excited to uh, share this collaborative research with the Arlington Police Department on this uh, police patrol deployment strategies, which we propose a, a prediction line decision analytics approach to support their decision making process. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask me uh, by the end of the talk. So I wanted to uh, introduce our research team first. So we have uh, in our industrial engineering department, we are working I'm working with Dr. Chen, Dr. Kent, Dr. Hent. On the faculty side, we also have students who had made a tremendous uh, efforts on this research. Uh, at the same time, so we'll also get uh, very uh, valuable advices and suggestions from our faculty member over at uh, Criminology and Criminal Justice, Dr. Kent and uh, Professor Gomez, who actually uh, uh, providing all of the uh, suggestions from the uh, policing criminology and police department perspective, make sure we are doing our research on the right track, make sure we also use the, you know, the, the right terminologies, etc. So this is our team and then uh, this is a quick uh, outline for my talk today. I wanted to start with a very brief introduction of the police patrol operations and then I wanted to particularly emphasize all these uh, uh, challenges, uh, current challenges with some of the uh, major issues, also some of the research gaps in the current literature. And then followed by that, I'm going to propose this um, 
uh, this uh, research methodology, have a brief review of this decision analytics too, and see how we can use that to uh, make better uh, decision making uh, to uh, to improve the outcome of p uh, police patrolling. And then since this is ongoing research, uh, firstly, we have some preliminary work that has been conducted, so I wanted to share some of the preliminary results. And then after that, I'm going to conclude the study with some future work. So we all know that police patrolling plays a very important role in public safety. So they are protecting our citizens and the communities. Specifically, they have two objectives. One is to respond to the 911 calls. So that including call for services and, and also including the uh, crime. And then the second objective is to reduce crime. So based on the type of crime, uh, the definition of by the FBI, we have part one and part two. So part one is more severe crimes versus part two is relative minor crimes. So and then we have violence and property as the uh, as part of the uh, part one crimes as example. So here's the some data showing the number of 911 calls across the United States. So the number one is California, which has uh, 20 more than 27 million 911 calls per year. So Texas actually followed as a second position. And then we have New York and Florida all have very high number of 911 calls, which are more than 10 million number of calls per year. So that's actually a lot of workload for the police officers to handle those calls we wanted to address by the research. And then this uh, this figures shows the uh, number of uh, violence crimes, the, the figure on the left versus the crime, uh, property crimes. Uh, so and then the, the right pie chart shows the breakdowns of the uh, violence and the property crimes in Texas. So we can see the property crimes actually almost five times than the violent crimes. And also the top one of uh, violent crime is the uh, aggravated assault. And then the number one property crime is uh, larceny theft. So those are some of the um, high volume crimes in the communities. So the major issues and challenges we wanted to address by doing placing research, uh, I wanted to discuss a little bit on that. So uh, we had a uh, workshop which is addressing the decision analytics for dynamic placing that was supported by the NSF and the National Institute of Justice. So we are organizing this workshop with uh, three other institutions. We invited the uh, researchers from the uh, decision analytics operations research, also the researchers from criminology as well as the police department in the community to come to this workshop and discuss the future research directions on this dynamic placing areas. So if you're interested in, we have a, a website which has this link here, so you can check some of the materials has been posted based on this uh, workshop. So based on this workshop, we have identified some of the issues and the challenges uh, in the current uh, placing uh, uh, research as well as in the practice. So the uh, one First one here is the imbalanced supply and demand. We know the placing resources are very limited. However, on the other side, the demand is very high as we show the statistics of those number of 911 calls and the number of crimes. So that's actually a very uh, big challenge for some of the police department that they are saying that they have really uh, challenging time to do the recruiting and also the uh, retention of the qualified officers. And then the next one is the static and that di versus dynamic operations. So the current operations of most uh, police department that do on a daily basis is more they're using the uh, fixed schedule, their deployment schedule of the officers. However, the criminal behavior are dynamic. And also there's uh, answer, there's a lot of uncertainty involved to that. At the same time, they can also adapt their behavior to the environment. So this actually the static pattern or fashion of doing the police patrol operations cannot actually meet the needs that can address the dynamic crimes over time. And the next issue is the uh, 
reactive operation versus proactive operation. So and in the traditional placing, they normally police respond to the calls in a reactive manner, meaning that the, when the crime or the call for services occurred and then they will go to address those. So this is more like a reactive pattern uh, fashion. However, we wanted to in, in order to prevent crime before it happening, we have to consider more proactive approach here. And also we know the officer's wellness has been also a very uh, kind of to hot topic in the in the workshop they wanted to address since they are con con continuously working on a very high uh, pressured environment. So they're in experiencing anxiety, the stress compared to the other uh, professions. So that's a very important issue. And actually, actually uh, police department actually uh, in, uh, putting a lot of efforts to address this. So for example, the APD actually uh, developed the, uh, they call the blue chip, blue uh, feed programs that provide free services to their officers with the uh, physical programs and also the mental programs so they can address their issue appropriately. And then, however, on the other side, those things, how it going to in turn affect the operational outcome. So that's actually the right, uh, need more research to address. The equitable outcomes is also another uh, a challenge, may not be the last one uh, in this topic, but uh, we, we know the deployment of the police resources shall afford all neighborhoods a chance without, uh, you know, regardless of their characteristics to lower the crime and also to improve the quality of life. But I have some statistic regarding the disparities of the use of force that has been discussed over time. Uh, in particular across those communities of color. So one in five Americans interact with the law enforcement yearly. Of those encounters, one million results in use of force. And if that person is black, then you're two to four times more likely to have force used than if you are not. So those are some uh, high level kind of the challenges and major issues we wanted to address. So based on this research, we wanted to hopefully address some of those issues and to improve the, uh, you know, make the uh, uh, policing outcome more efficient, effective and also equitable. So one of the key questions you may, uh, uh, you know, ask or there's some of the studies has been trying to address this is whether more police will lead to less crime. So that's kind of the uh, philosophy in the traditional policing. So meaning that if you allocate more officers, actually it can help reduce crime. However, whether this is true or not is still a question since the there's, uh, you know, mixed uh, results or findings has been uh, reported over time. So this has been a topic we wanted to also uh, wanted to have some research to address. Since uh, you know in recent years uh, because of the data which we have been able to collect more and more data. Also the advanced of the, uh, you know, the modeling techniques doing prediction. So this is the predictable placing has been uh, getting more and more attention uh, in it. Uh, so what is predictive placing or we call it a prediction led placing? Basically uh, by definition, it means we collect data from multiple sources, could be the 911 call, could be the body camera. So there's some different ways that we can collect policing data. And then we're going to analyze those data using the modeling techniques. And then we use the result, re results to inform some decision making towards. Uh, and then we wanted to from there to prevent and to respond those crime and calls more effectively. So those are the uh, basic you know, definition of the uh, predictive placing. So many studies has been doing this for now. So this is um, and the figure showing a uh, crime mapping. So that's one of the techniques they're using to map the crimes into a specific location. They actually divided the whole region. This is Washington DC. So divided into the grades so they can pinpoint the number of crimes that has been occurred in a particular area. So this figure actually the robbery that occurs in the Washington DC. So and then the big data since we're collecting more and more data. So we're using the techniques and then 
and by hoping by doing that, it can enable the predict placing by allowing the officer to understand where and when crime is mostly likely to occur. So and then we can target our placing resources to those areas in the right time. And this is the um, a framework that has been proposed by the Rand Corporation, who has been doing a lot of analytics, trying to translate the theories into more uh, practical applications. So this framework has been uh, uh, developed for the predict uh, prediction like placing as a business process. As you can see here, there are four processes or components. We starting from collecting data, as we mentioned, we can collecting data from different sources. We're using those data to uh, make some analysis and to address the prediction uh, of understanding where and uh, where, where and when the crime would occur. So we can address our police operations accordingly, and then we will implement those uh, decisions or the actions come from this, uh, you know, decision making, and then we will uh, uh, see the, how the criminal going to respond to that, and then the whole environment will be altered, and then we'll start to recollect the data. So that's kind of a uh, loop here. So we also at the same time have some feedback in between the criminal response back to the police operations to see how effective of those interventions are. So this framework has been implied to analyze the decision making at the general level and also may also use for address specific problem or crime types. Since this uh, prediction placing has been gained so much attention, however, there's also some pitfalls has been reported in this predictive placing in doing uh, in uh, supporting decision making. So I wanted to discuss some of those. The first one is this: uh, the studies so far has been focusing on primarily on the prediction accuracy. So we have a lot of prediction model or forecast model trying to make a more accurate prediction on the call volumes in a particular area at a specific time rather than its tactical utility, meaning that how we use that information to inform how we're going to make decisions. So for example, if we predict the whole city as a hotspot, then how are we going to gain some new information to address how the police should be deployed. So that's kind of the questions hasn't been, uh, you know, uh, rigorously addressed in the uh, current literature. And then uh, based on that, so we also see there's a lack of the infective connections in between the prediction and also how we make the decision making. So we see some of simple um, uh, uh, kind of rules that guidance the decision. However, we need a more effective way to make the connections in between the prediction analysis and how we make the decision. The third one here is the lack of systematic evaluation of the policing performance. So um, since the police officers are limited, Right, so if we allocate those police officers on a certain activity, certainly, uh, you know, the number of officers can be allocated on some other activities will be limited. So in uh, consequently, the whole, the dynamic of the whole policing system will be uh, changed accordingly. So how we address the changes from a systematic view is still a question. One example could be if we're allocating the more officers to doing the investigation uh, to on certain buildings, if a certain you know risk presents, so they need to do more investigations on those buildings, and then there will be less officer can be assigned to do the traffic stops. OK, and then consequently, when we look at the data, the data probably will show a decrease on the number of the, for example, the uh, DUI cases, meaning the travel, uh, driving under influences or driving uh, 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 with the uh, with the uh, intoxicated, uh, intoxicated cases, mean, meaning the drunk behavior. So we will see some decreases in those cases. However, this may not be a good interpretation of the data since we have to 
since we need to look at the whole, uh, you know, the, the the data and also the system, how it changes, you know, dynamically and from that systematic view to address the data and, and interpret that appropriately. So that's still been a um, pitfall in the current research. And the last one, may, again, may not be the list, so we do not fully taking the advantage of the computer simulation and big data to test interventions prior to the implementation. So one of the big benefits of using computer simulation is that we can test those different uh, interventions before we do the cost of the uh, implementation. However, most of the favorable approach today still be the random trial control to you know to test the effectiveness of the interventions in the placing world so that's actually uh, has been dominated so we wanted to leverage those computer simulation techniques with the big data and to see how we actually make a cheaper you know decision making solution before we run into the more costly uh, practical implementation so those are some of the research gaps and hopefully we're uh, by doing this research, research can address some of those gaps. The ultimate goal for this research is to develop a data-driven prediction-led decision analytics approach to facilitate the placing decision making towards achieving more effective, efficient, and equitable placing outcomes. So that's kind of our ultimate goal for this overall research, and we are still on the um, on the kind of ongoing research towards this goal. And then to in order to achieve that, we're thinking from the uh, approach that needs to incorporate three traits. One is the proactive. One is the dynamic and one is the performance driven. So the proactive con components will enable actions to prevent incidents from happening. OK, this is compared to the uh, a reactive a reactive uh, patrol operations, meaning that it happened already and then we're trying to address that. So the proactive approach can help us to before it happening to prevent it. And then the dynamic components will update the placing decisions in a dynamic context given the forecast demand. Again, so that's kind of in contrast to the static way when they deploy officers to the uh, to the placing district or the placing bits. And then the performance driven components will focus on the performance metrics and their associations and hopefully also we can address some ca causality with the placing outcome. For example, how the workload out of the officers will affect their performance of the patrolling. So this slide shows our proposed analytical framework, how we do the decision making. So we start with the data collection at the beginning of a decision win uh, making window, and then we collect two types of data in general. One is the uh, 911 calls, and the other one is the patrol operational data. So after collecting those data based on the 911 call, we will do the forecasting model, and then we run some analysis based on those input data. And then basically we're deriving the uh, appropriate statistic distributions to represent those forecasted uh, volume of the call. And then we're incorporating the decision making. It could be the currently in use uh, deployment strategies or the one we proposed as the one we're trying to improve. And then we, based on those information, we create a simulation model to mimic the dynamic of the patrol operations. And then we come from the simulation outputs. We further analyze those data. One of the metrics we're going to use for this output is called the call response time of the call. We can look at that by different call priorities. And then we consider whether this performance is acceptable. If it is acceptable, for example, for this call response time, the emergency call, which is the highest priority call, needs to take some immediate action needs to be response uh, less than six minutes. The priority one, which is the next level of priority, needs to be response within 10 minutes. So if those performance will be uh, is accepted or satisfied, then we will 
uh, we will continue with the output decision analysis, uh, uh, de uh, deployment decisions, and to trying to put into the uh, you know the schedule, and then we can implement it. Otherwise, we're going to come back and update our deployment decisions, and then we run the simulation model. We update our outputs and to check the uh, performance measure again. So that's kind of in a loop. And then once the output uh, decision making has been finalized, we will record the data back to our operational data. And then at the same time, we'll also update our decision making to kind of go into the outer loop of this whole uh, dynamic placing uh, strategy. So I will start talking about some of the data we collected, and then we will talk about different components in this dynamic framework. So a little bit background on, on the APD Arlington Police Department, which is actually very close to our campus. So we ha they have four districts called North, West, East and South. So uh, as shown in this map, and then each district is further divided into eight smaller area, they call it beats. So it's also labeled on the map, so you can see. So the area may not be the same, so they each of the district will be divided into those eight bits. OK, and then. Some of the patrol operations when we talk to the APD officers, so where we know that each district has their own office and then they manage their operations kind of uh, independently. And then the officer can respond to the calls in the same district here. However, they normally do not a cross beat to do, uh, you know, the calls for other district. And then each officer can work a maximum uh, 40 hours per week. For example, they can do four days a week and then each shift will be 10 hours long. And then the gaps in between the two consecutive shifts has to be eight hours minimum during the 40 uh, 24 hour period. So those are some general information when we talk to the uh, police officers to understand how they actually run the operations. Specifically, we also collect the 911 calls. Uh, we have the spatial attributes. As we mentioned, we have the district information of the call and then we have the beats. We have also the GAS, the X, Y coordinates of the call, which is a very detailed level of the spatial information. And also we have the temporal attributes that including actually months of the year, day of the week. They also have the shift or the blanket and hour information. So that's get into the you know more granular level of the temporal attributes. In addition to the spatial temporal attributes, we also gather some important attributes of the calls, including the priority. As we mentioned, we have they have four levels. The emergent one is the highest, followed by one, two, and three. And then they also have different dispatching modes, meaning whether this call is actually needs a dis officer to be dispatched or the officer actually self initiated to handle the call. For if the officer patrolling on the street and they did uh, see some abnormal behavior, uh, abnormal behavior, so and then they will go and check. So those kind of the one we call self initiated. And then we also gathered information on the call type. On the high level, we have the call either the crime versus the call for services, and then they have actually divided into those into uh, like a minor uh, categories. For example, the crime has the part one, part two, and part one can further divide it into violence versus uh, property, and then they can be further divided into even finer uh, categories. So overall, we collect data on more than 200 uh, call types in the data site. Based on the 911 call data, we did some descriptive analysis on that. So these two figures shows the uh, the uh, the call, uh, uh, call volumes by district. So the upper one shows the patterns, the monthly patterns, and the bottom one shows the patterns based on the day of the week. So overall, we can see the North District, which is demonstrated in the orange line, has the high volume versus the East District in general has the low volume, which also hold for the day of the week. So that's 
if we look at the map, so the North District is actually our entertainment district, which holds a lot of special events. And so those could be the uh, the area actually in, uh, having more, uh, you know, calls and crimes in this area. And in particular, we also make the observe some, you know, patterns over the months. We see the, you know, over the winter time, it kind of dropped down and then starting to pick up over the other seasons. So this is uh, based on the month of the uh, year and also day of the week. And also we do a finer uh, analysis on the bracket, which we divided five bracket of the day, which we have one hour kind of over a uh, double counted in this case, since we have five bracket hour, uh, five hours per bracket. Uh, so uh, from the morning time to the evening time, we see actually the bracket three, which represents 4 p.m. to 9 p.m. actually on average showing the most uh, kind of the uh, showing the higher volume compared to the other branches and in the early morning which from 2 to 7 that's our branching 5 overall shows the lowest uh, co volume okay and then we can further dig into it and to see specific uh, patterns. And based on this time series data, we can do the forecasting models to understand the, uh, you know, how the crime changes over time. We also collect data on the patrol operations on the officers schedule. As we mentioned, the officers are doing 10 hour shift a day. So the number of officers varies within one shift due to the overlapping of the consecutive shift. So you can see here on the bottom. So those are the hours has been assigned to each shift. So each day we have four 10 hour shifts. A, B, C, and D. They kind of overlap each other except the six to, I'm sorry, seven to 11, which kind of only shift A handles those out four hours. And this is the figure on the right showing the uh, actual number of officers has been allocated or assigned to each shift by different district. So those numbers are used later on to inform our computer simulation model to mimic how the operations of the patrolling. And we also talk to the officers to understand their process. So this is kind of the high level uh, process we captured uh, to show how this uh, patrolling works. So starting from the call arrivals, and then there will be a call representative that handles the call over at the call center. So they collect information, identify or doing the triage of the call uh, based for their priority. So that's going to be very quick, just uh, maybe a couple seconds to a minute or so. And then the, they will send it to the dispatch officer through the electronic system and the dispatcher or the dispatching officer will search for the uh, nearest officer or who has been allocated to a particular uh, district or particular beats who can actually who, who are available to handle the call and then they will send the order to the patrol officer then then once the patrol officer receive the call they will start to travel to the uh, to the crime or to the incident scene and then they will handle the case and then after that period of time the call will be closed or complicated with certain disposition um, perhaps and then we Based on this uh, a call response process, we're looking for, we're having two measures. One is the call response time, as we mentioned earlier. So that has been defined uh, based on the time when the call arrives to the time actually the first unit of the officer arrived to the scene. So this time in between is captured by the response time. And also we have the time on call. So that's actually the time when the officer arrived and then the time they spend on to handle the call. So that's the time on call and then call response time. We can also consider the wait time of the call, which how long they've been waiting for dispatching uh, for different priority of the call, they may have different response to that since again, the officer will be limited. So some of the call with the low priority needs to wait for the uh, high priority calls handled first. 
So this slide showing the dispatching rules. I'm just going to go through this quickly. So they have based on the priority we mentioned, they will have different uh, rules how they're going to dispatching the officer. So again, based on the high priority like a zero and a one, they may preempt the officer if the officer currently is busy. However, if the emergency call comes and so they will still dispatch the busy officer to stop their current service and then to uh, uh, to uh, handle the emergent one. Although that is not a um, uh, always happen, but this, uh, you know, if that's the case, they will certainly preempt the officer to handle the high priority calls. And uh, for the low priority calls uh, for uh, two and three, so they were actually looking for the officers actually being designated to a specific uh, policing beats. And then only the beat officer will handle the those priority uh, call with number two and three for that. If the queue uh, has been waiting long, so they have to prioritize their queue and then to handle those calls appro uh, properly. OK, so that's kind of the uh, dispatching uh, dispatching rules, how they uh, dispatch the officers to handle different priority of the call. So based on that information with the 911 call data and also the uh, understanding of the how the police officer do the patrolling, we start to build our computer simulation model to represent the call. Uh, the, how the call is uh, uh, responded. So to do the computer simulation, we use what we call the agent based computer simulation, which is a we call the bottom up computer simulation approach. This is in compared to two other simulation methodologies. One is called system dynamics. One is a process uh, centric dis discrete event simulation. So the uh, system dynamic or the discrete event simulation is a bottom uh, uh, top down approach, which has some you know parameters has been developed at the beginning. So kind of govern the overall system and versus the agent uh, agent based model starting from bottom up looking at attributes and the behavior of each individuals in the system and the modeled interactions in between them and then the overall or the aggregated system dynamic will driven completely by the individual behaviors. So that gave us a more capability to model the system in a more realistic way. So here capture some of the main components in the agent based simulation, what we call ABM. So we need to have the agents. So agents can be any entities in your system. So the, in the placing uh, simulation, we're looking for, we are using the uh, police officer. We have agents also have the call agents as well as the uh, the district and also the beat agents, which is our spatial objects. And each of those agents will be assigned to specific uh, attributes to represent them and also the behavior rules that govern how they perform uh, you know to conduct certain activities and then again we're looking for their how they interact with each other and also how they interact with the environment for example the environmental factor could be if we change certain policies or certain strategies and then how they influence the behavior of the of the agents and then how they adapt their behaviors to you know to change the dynamic of the overall system so the uh, objective for our simulation model, we have two. One is to develop this realistic representation that mimics the police patrol operations. And the second one is to evaluate different policing strategies. For example, the hotspot policing, if the, you know, the area has been identified with a high crime volume, and then how we allocate our officers or target our you know, resources to those areas to response calls and to, uh, you know, uh, prevent crimes. So we can uh, looking at different strategies and using the simulation model to do the evaluations. Just a little bit more uh, design elements. As we mentioned, we have three uh, primary agent classes in the uh, in the model: co-agents, district and beat agents, and police agents. 
So here are the call attributes. So that come from our 911 call, including the spatial information, the arrival time, and then the, uh, the call type priority and the dispatching mode. And then for the district, we have the GIS boundary. So one other benefit of using the agent based uh, simulation in particular with the two are using code and logic, we can actually incorporate some of the GIS components and features into the model and study some spatial analysis for the you know, patrol operations. So back to the district, uh, district and beat agents. So in addition to the GIS region, we also have the number of officers can be assigned to each district and also also the working officers for a particular shift. So those are some examples of the uh, beast and uh, uh, district agents. And for the police uh, agents, we have the demographic information, we have their schedules, and we have their working status and also what are the codes that has been handled can also be stored in the, uh, in the program. So here's some of the uh, uh, model components we used and hopefully later I'll have time to show you a quick demo. So that's actually captured the process we just mentioned earlier. How, that's the call response process from the call arrival doing the triage and then we branch it out to different district. As we mentioned, they uh, each district has their kind of independent operations and then they will go through this, you know, process call. Um, uh, uh, this exit uh, entering point and then they will continue with the dispatching process and then once the call is dispatched to a particular office officer and then they will do the travel and then process and then the call will be closed so that's follow exactly we show uh, based on the you know patrol uh, process information and then more detailed, we are also capturing the uh, police officers with the, you know, their work start to work uh, starting at their shift at the station. They start to do the random patrolling in their assigned beats, and then they will move to the scene to handle a case if the dispatch order is received, and then they will handle the case. After that, we'll, they will go back to the random patrolling states. So this is the state charts in our model, and then this kind of trend uh, models the transition in between different stage to govern their behavior. And overall, we're actually looking for the operational uh, outcome in particular in this research is the call response time. And then we also uh, have the officer workload captured uh, in certain scenarios. So before we do the uh, run, we need to validate our model, which we have using the response time to vary that under different three scenarios. One is come from the actual data. One is we use the actual 911 call data. That's the raw data to inform our simulation and we get our simulated response time. We also did some statistic analysis to get uh, a poison distribution to capture the arrival rate per, per, uh, per hour and then we simulate our model. So this we uh, come up with three uh, charts and then we did some uh, t-test and to uh, pair t-test to run some significant uh, testing to see whether they have uh, you know significant difference and then the results actually showing that there's no statistical significance uh, in between these scenarios and then we connect different scenarios of the uh, deployment decisions on the simulation model. So quickly go through one of the scenarios we have is to compare the eight hour versus 10 hour shift. Uh, so previously the officer APD actually doing the eight hour shift and now they transit to the 10, 10 hour shift. So we wanted to understand which one is more efficient. As you can see the right the right dot line representing the eight hour shift versus the blue solid line representing the 10 hour shift. So overall, the 10 hour shift is more effective compared to the eight hour shift in response time. Also, the officer's workload has been also decreased uh, significantly if we assign the uh, two officers to handle a particular beat in during the 10 hour shift. So this is the uh, comparison in between the eight hour versus 10 hour shift. Also, we try some hotspot placing. As we mentioned, those hotspot placing focus on the small areas that where, or where the crime uh, is concentrated. 
So there's uh, some random control studies has been conducted early on. So we have I have included some of the preliminary results based on that uh, random trial control. So but overall we see some reductions uh, based on the hotspot placing. So we want to also use the simulation model to test it on those uh, strategies. So how the hotspot placing works in APD, they have a team called how heat team stands for hotspot enforcement and assistant team. So th this team officer, uh, heat officers has been designated to uh, those identified hotspots. So we have each uh, each district have four dynamic heat officers in addition to those regular uh, patrol officers and they're working on specific shift. So this slide is showing the uh, the uh, baseline scenario on the left, which without the house block placing, so that's the response time based on different priorities. And then the other two showing the hotspots based on the different ways we actually identify the hotspots. So the threshold we're using the third quantile, meaning by looking at the call volume per week, we identify the third quantile, meaning that if the call volume is higher than 70% of the data points, then that beads will be identified as a hotspot versus the figure on the right showing we are using the thread holes, uh, the medium or the second quantile, meaning that if the call volume that is more than uh, half of the data point, then we consider that as hotspots. So, basic, uh, uh, so basically the, 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 this way, the right figure showing the one that we have more hotspot uh, hot beads has been identified in the situation. So you can see the so if the patrol office, the heat officer is working on more house beats, they're doing the rotation on different beats, kind of patrolling in different area randomly. They can, uh, you know, reduce the response time of six, around five to six minutes for the priority three. Sorry about the label. It should be E, one, two, and three compared to the without uh, policing, uh, house policing, policing strategies. So that one uh, for the emergency call, they reduce about a uh, one minute or so, but it's actually very critical in placing war to respond to the call in a very uh, efficient manner. So that's actually showing that that hotspot placing actually take good in, uh, impact on responding call efficiency. So quickly, uh, uh, the last components is the forecasting 911 calls I wanted to mention. So we are working on different uh, models. So this is again, that's still ongoing. We have already tested on three models, which has been well established in the forecasting model for the time series data. So we're using this three methodologies, including this ARIMA model, house methods, and this MLP models to uh, forecast the crime data. So we divided our uh, 2000 2017 911 call data into a training data sets and the uh, testing data sets and using the training to predict and to compare the performance on the testing data sets. So we're using the mean square error to measure the performance of the forecasting. So you can see here we did this by district. So each district we have an independent model for the three methodologies. So on the uh, bottom we're showing the ARIMA model for the South District using this parameter. So the MSE, the mean square arrow, measures the actual um, uh, actual uh, actual uh, call volume versus the predictive volume. So the residual, which is the difference, actually gave us how accurate your prediction is and we're looking at on average. So the ARIMA model actually showing the best outcome over the three models. So in conclusion, the proposed analytic framework of the police patrol deployments uh, shows some good potential to enable proactive, dynamic, and effective patrol operations. So we're using this agent-based simulation model to which after we uh, validation to represent the police uh, patrol operations based on the 911 call and operational data that we derive from the uh, Arlington Police Department. And also we use that model to demonstrate the how we evaluate different uh, police deployment strategies. Also, we did uh, three uh, forecasting models so far uh, to forecast the 911 calls in the future. 
And some future work may including to continue to develop the forecasting model as we only try the three while well establish the methodologies in the future we can continue to try more rigorous models and to see if we can further improve the prediction accuracy and then we wanted to increase so for now we kind of study the pieces you know independently so we wanted to actually incorporate the forecasting model into the simulation uh, uh, agent based simulation and to study how the different strategy is going to be um, evaluated and see their effectiveness. And then based on that, we can also conducting some optimization, looking for the optimal solution of the strategy. Uh, one other interesting uh, study, which is uh, getting more and more attention in the current literature, is the how we model the criminal behavior. All of this is actually some of the data we're actually using the existing, you know, hotspot uh, placing uh, results to inform the model, like how many crimes or the calls can be reducted uh, or can be reduced. So. Uh, actually, the criminal behavior is not explicitly represented. However, based on some of the theories of the criminals, including the rational behavior versus uh, some of the you know routine activities, saying that the uh, uh, the criminal actually lazy to go to other you know area. They always stay in their familiar uh, areas to commit crimes, and also the deterrent theorem, saying that if they see the uh, you know police officers presence in the area then they would they would deter their criminal uh, their behavior so that's kind of the behavior uh, theories that we can apply into the agent based model since they allow us to create the behavior of the individuals so by incorporating that we can create a more realistic model to represent the overall system and also upon that, as we mentioned, the officer wellness and the equity outcomes, we can continue to you know, explore some opportunities from that perspective. So that's kind of all my uh, talk today. So thank you very much for joining me today. And if you have any questions, you can send me over the chat. OK, thank, thank you very you. much. Sure. That is all for uh, a very very interesting talk on you know a very topical issue so i will uh, ask the audience uh, if you have any questions uh, please uh, put it in the chat window and i'll read it out and while people are doing that i'm going to start off the discussion with that uh, really big question which everybody i'm sure would be having which is you know the, the sort of predictive analytics uh, you know where you're trying to Put resources in a particular geographical region or trying to uh, maybe determine uh, uh, you know where to distribute resources is that is that connected with uh, all these issues on profiling that uh, people are concerned about these days i mean uh, you know profiling is mm. uh, you understand what i mean right yes. profiling so we yes, don't want profiling. to be yeah they do criminal profiling and right. understanding you know what are the profile or the characteristics that can be associated with particular you know you know person right and then they they were saying a lot of crimes actually if we look at the data i don't have it on top of my mind but they have a lot of re what they call it repetitive repetitive crime meaning that if you conduct a crime and then you will you know kind of doing it repeatedly so those actually take a large portion of the you know the crime the crime volume so you know people uh, the police officer actually trying to do that profiling to understand that and trying to you know you know do the predicted to to looking for those characteristics in particular with their technologies these days right they have the camera everywhere even though they still a they have some challenges with the data they collected in terms of how to use it <laughs> so but they do have the opportunity to you know explore that in the you know I guess I guess my question was more on the sensitive topic of racial profiling. So, for example, when you're trying to determine hotspots, do you only mm -hmm. look at prior 911 data, or do you also look at demographic information that maybe a lot of uh, oh. Yeah, oh, OK, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I got that. Yeah, yeah, so that's actually something we wanted to improve the model. So you can see for now, currently our model is kind of only capture relatively a small set of the attributes that we incorporate because we wanted to test to see if the model can work well as we expected. But definitely we can further incorporate the characteristic of the community 
for example, if this, you know, based on the income or the, you know, the race or the ethnicity, so those characteristics can be built into the model and to further study how the police officer should be able, uh, should be uh, allocated in those, uh, you know, communities and to do different, you know, activities in order but, to. But isn't that precisely the problem that if you start taking into account what are considered sensitive attributes, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, that, uh, you know, the, the racial, racial profile of the neighborhood mm -hmm. or, the, or yeah. the income group, if these attributes are used to make your models, quote unquote, more accurate, yeah. uh, you know, that is, that can run uh, into problems, right? right that is what right. is called, uh, uh, you know, racial profiling. So that's racial, what I'm concerned. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, right. We well, actually I didn't show here, but we do some, you know, house about, you know, mapping on the, mm -hmm. you know, spatial region and then we can actually see where the crime or uh, the property crime may occur versus where the violent crime may occur. So by having this, you know, maybe that's going to be, a, a, you know, associated with the characteristics the race and income characteristic of the community for sure. Yeah. OK, thank you. So there's one question from the audience. Uh, how accepting of police departments to this set of uh, predictive policing? Oh, that's a very good question. I suppose to mention at the beginning of my uh, presentation, actually the uh, Arlington Police Department is very, very supportive. They're kind of have the very open minded versus some other kind of uh, uh, police department may not that open to this type of research. So that's why we get it. You know, they have been pretty engaged in this, you know, research and providing us information and so on to do this pretty because they see the potential. And we also actually show them our similar model one time and then they can actually see the entities the agents moving around and then to see how they can you know based on that and to address some of the issue they may see oh this is not exactly they're expecting why is that so they may trigger some of the ones that we may not not have the knowledge to address so that's actually very I think it's very healthy co collaboration with them to do this predictive placing yeah, actually I have a quick demo to show I don't know if I have time or opportunity but I have a uh, Sure. Yeah, I can. Yeah, so I can share my. Uh, let me stop this presentation and then reshare my. So I'm just gonna share my desktop. Can Can you see my screen? Yes. So this is the one we, the agent-based model we we created for mimicking the uh, police patrol operations. So this is built, has been built in the Analogic, which is a multi-simulation software. Um, so uh, as we said, we build a different. So this is a spatial region with the GIS components. You can see those uh, uh, each district or the each beat has been divided into by this boundary. So that's actually be considered as an object. So this again, that's object uh, object-oriented programming. So and then we can assign different attributes based on that. And then the dots represents those officers at our own shift. So they are working and then we have the office in each district also has been represented there. So they will do the random patrolling, uh, you know, in their assigned area. And then we have the let me move a little faster so we can looking at different um, you know, uh, the, the agents, which you can from, from the drop, drop down list. And then this is showing what we have for the when the call arrives. That's the dispatching process. And then once the call has been dispatched to different, uh, you know, a district, and then they will go to the particular district, like North District, and then they will go through this dispatching process and we're recording the response time based on the call. And then we also track the behavior or uh, mimicking the behavior of the officer. So I have it here. So the officer, if they're working, their states will be highlighted. For example, this officer is currently handling the case or the incidents. And then this officer is actually doing the random patrolling. So we can use that. Each one of those will represent a particular agents, police, uh, police officers in this, you know, in this model. So you can see out. So the, the, the square, if you can see, is very small. So by different color, it represents the different priority of the calls. And then the officer will go to there and to handle the call. So that's how we visualize the model. So I just wanted to show and then yeah. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, so I have maybe one last question uh, before we wrap up because we're getting close to the end of the hour. Okay. So uh, this is a question on some of the technology that you have used in your data analytics. Uh, so you use uh, simulation approaches like agent-based simulation. You mentioned uh, one of the top-down techniques, discrete event simulation. And then for the time series forecasting, you use ARIMA models, right? Right. Did you consider sort of uh, AI machine learning approaches to any of these problems? Because mm -hmm. there's a lot of data, there's a lot of forecasting, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, so I would think that that would be also a pretty natural uh, approach to try, right? <laughs> Definitely, these days they're talking about like intelligent or smarter placing, right? Mm -hmm. So yes, I'm looking since I'm in the more from the industrial engineering, we're doing, you know, resource allocation, you know, optimization, mm -hmm. this kind of decision making part. I'm definitely looking for, you know, collaborations who have the expertise in the artificial intelligence, machine learning, so mm -hmm. we can, you know, continue to build this research in a, you know, kind of, you know, making it grow. So yeah, so that will be, you know, definitely. Great. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you very much for a very fascinating uh, talk. Uh, appreciated uh, thank spending you. time with us. Uh, so this brings a close to the brown bag series for this semester, uh, folks. Uh, we will be continuing it over the fall semester, and we should have some sort of schedule out uh, sometime in the summer. So please check back. And until then, you know, have a great uh, weekend and great summer. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Desk.